we thought um, of all the people that we could think of that, that, that are, are distinguished and, and scholarly and uh, have a lot of, of, of gravity to them to share about the history of living word, who better than Dan Moser? So did you notice I didn't say the O word? But Dan, uh, come on up and share with the Lord Geek. Thank you, Ted. Good morning, everyone. Just to look out here and see this array of living word history is an amazing experience, isn't it? So there, as I look out, there are numerous people sitting here today who are much more qualified to give a, hist a brief history of living word. I thank the Lord I get to do it, but some of you would do a much better job. Um, so 10 minutes, that means I have uh, 60 seconds per decade or six seconds per year. So as it has been said, starting on Wednesday night from Pastor Dave and also this morning, and also from our 80th anniversary when uh, Anne wrote up a, a amazing history, great is thy faithfulness. We know that if a congregation goes for 100 years, you know it's going to go through some trials and tribs along the way. Great is th thy faithfulness. And his grace has been sufficient for us. So as many of us know, the roots of this congregation go all the way back to the uh, Azusa Street Revival and particularly the Welsh Revival uh, around 1905. And there were two prayer partners here in Philadelphia, uh, one white and one black woman who just had knit hearts together in prayer and intercession, hungry for God. Uh, they traveled to Wales and they talked with leaders there and that was in the early 20s. And then um, in 1923, there was an outcropping of um, from that revival that a pastor came here and started what was called East Lansdowne Gospel Temple, obviously, and just west of the city in East Lansdowne. And uh, so they were on the cutting edge at the time and through the years as uh, various pastors uh, over, over that time uh, ministered. And in uh, the late 40s, some of us have heard of the Latter Rain Movement. And we were in the middle of that Latter Rain Movement in 1947. Pastor Fred Poole, who came, whose roots were in that revival and had pastored in Canada. He had come from Wales and then came down from Canada uh, to be the pastor of East Lansdowne Gospel Temple. And then there was a word of prophecy. Well, actually, just one little uh, fact before that. Uh, Fred Poole was very well known and and again, in the middle of the latter rain movement. So he was speaking at a conference in Detroit uh, linked with Sister Beale, who was well known in that revival at the time. Um, and there was a young teenager, 15 year old teenager who was just hungry for God. And she heard uh, Fred Poole speak and got to talk with him and meet him and all. Uh, someone who later we would know as Marion Hone. Marianne, can you stand up for one moment? Uh, fairly soon, Marianne will be celebrating her 90th birthday. So, so in 1953, uh, a prophecy came forth. Uh, Gospel Temple was known to be uh, a prophetic uh, church using the gift of prophecy uh, rightly before the Lord. And it said we would be a fountain of life in the center of the city flowing out to the ends of the earth. So Pastor Fred Poole did not turn a deaf ear to that. He 
shop, you know, looked around, asked the leading of the Lord, and came up with this building right here. So in 1954-55, uh, they purchased this building, and now we were called Philadelphia Gospel Temple. So that satisfied the first part of the prophecy. Now we were in the middle of the city. Okay, well, how about the second part to the ends of the earth? Um, so basically, we started then sending out uh, missionaries. But in 1954, here in Philadelphia, there was a, a teenager uh, who had just come to the Lord. And then when the congregation moved here, he started attending here and was heavily influenced by Pastor Poole. Uh, his name uh, was John Hone, and he was in the youth group as a teenager uh, with the pastor's son, John Poole. Okay. Um, so Pastor Fred had a radio ministry here um, in the Philadelphia area called The Living Word. And uh, so they started sending out the missionaries to fulfill the second part of that prophecy and be obedient to the Lord. So some of us who have been here for a long time, there was a short little uh, senior citizen named Sally Steele who used to sit right back there. And I didn't, there were a lot of people, and I didn't really know Sally, uh, but she was the first missionary to be sent out and ministered in India, um, to the indigent in India for many years. And uh, then after that, as we know, Hank and Ann, uh, Moeller had laid his hand, hands laid on and went to Mexico and started El Rancho del Rey, which we hear more about later. Um, one of John Hone's buddies from the um, seminaries and all locally was named Ernie Tanner. And he, was, he came to this church uh, during his time in Philadelphia. He was from Europe. And then he went back to Europe and started uh, the first helicopter ministry one by one, he purchased a fleet of helicopters for preaching the gospel and for mercy ministry, emergency ministry uh, in Africa, Europe, and Asia. So all, all parts of the earth. And then Living Word in the, I mean, Gospel Temple <clears throat> also sent out, as we know, in 1963, Bill Pepper uh, went down to Peru and then also uh, a missionary named Dan Del Vecchio was sent out to Mexico and then ultimately to Spain. So that was uh, all in the 60s. And then uh, in the 60s and 70s, after the Latter Rain movement, then the Lord moved again mightily through the charismatic movement and also Jesus people uh, movement. And Gospel Temple was actively involved in that. And then also in the 60s, a similar, but a second prophecy came forth uh, in the congregation that said we would be like a wheel with many spokes going out from the hub to many parts of the earth. So God was just stirring up that uh, missionary spirit again. And then after that, uh, a couple named Larry and Lori Benlin were uh, sent to Italy. And um, also in the 60s, there was a, a young lady who had just recently been saved who started attending the service here. Her name was Ann Sharp, would be known later as Ann Sharp. And she brought her unsaved husband named Wendell Sharp. Said he used to sit in the back pew over there and you know, look out. And then the Lord put that hook in there, and he came to the Lord and started growing in responsibility. Had uh, They had a tremendous hunger for God. So then, excuse me, um, in the 70s, Gospel Temple planted six congregations, uh, some in New Jersey, uh, greater Philadelphia area, a few of which are still going today, with Pastor Phil being uh, the pastor of one of the original uh, Gospel Temple outreach churches. And then in the 80s, uh, from Northeast Living Word, where John Hone was pastoring at the time, uh, Ed and Joan Hornack were sent out to North Africa. And 
Then after that, Stephen Marianne Sadar uh, signed up with uh, Frontiers Ministry, which ministered to Muslims. And Steve was uh, involved in finance, has been the, uh, the CFO of that ministry. So again, reaching out to Muslims all over the world. And then, as we know, Vera Fernandez uh, was sent out. She went to Russia and then India and uh, back in the States now, as we know. John Kohler sent out to all parts of the earth. And uh, also, just one step back, in the, in the 80s, we had fruitful outreach. Excuse me, my screen, just keeping an eye on my clock here. Thank you. Okay. Um, Tremendous outreach to North Philadelphia. Uh, at that point, we were living word community and they purchased a house to do ministry, discipling and whatnot. Um, so, but no church is without some type of trials. You have to go through the fire at times. So, uh, and we live in a, a, a fallen world, even though, you know, it won't be when we get to be with Jesus. But uh, in the late 70s, Pastor uh, John Poole, who had taken over for his father after he had uh, got called home to the Lord in uh, 1963. John Poole had been pastoring and um, he left the church. So a lot of people left. So sometimes the question is, well, who were they following? Were they following strictly Jesus or Jesus and following a person? Uh -huh. So we were down to about what I was told 20 people uh, in the fellowship hall downstairs. It'd be too depressing to, to hold a service with just 20 people here upstairs. And uh, so Ron Klaus and the Sharps and some others hung in there. Now, this church could have closed at that time, but God was faithful. He had a purpose in history. And so he kept everything going. And then in the 80s, it was built up. And then the senior pastor at that time in 1989, Ron Klaus, uh, left uh, to, he was in a congregation in New Jersey. And there were five things that kept this congregation going at that time. Number one, the shepherding gift of Pastor Wendell Sharp. At 65 years old, he became the senior pastor. Uh, Ted and Steve Weaver were in their 30s. And folks wanted a senior pastor. They looked at Pastor Buck and said, you're the senior pastor. And that shepherding gift that he had really helped to bring healing to our congregation. Then Orville Swindle uh, came and stayed here for six weeks, preached on Sunday, ate in all of our homes and ministered and helped to, to bring healing. And then uh, Pastor Abraham and Eve Fenton were close friends of the Sharps and helped to strengthen them and uh, just help them to get through that difficult healing time. And then in 1994, God started the Kingdom Seeker Ministry with Mercy Outreach. And that every single person in the church was involved in some way, whether it was making lunches or whether they were here in person, God used that to get our eyes off ourself, get our eyes on Jesus and others who were in greater need than ourself. And also, uh, Ted and Karen Lewis, Steve and Ann Weaver, and Bob and Marilyn Dreer were paramount uh, in also our congregation uh, experiencing the healing that we needed at that time. So God brought us through a second huge challenge where things could have closed, but God was faithful. He had a purpose. So in closing, this congregation over the years has been some of the hallmarks. Okay, one has been anointed worship. They've always been known for anointed worship. And in more recent years, uh, through the vision of our sister Gretchen, anointed dance worship as well. Also, teaching the unadulterated Word of God. Not getting off and trendy stuff or whatever, or feel good, anything. The Word has always been the foundation of this congregation. Third is evangelism and outreach. Like more recently, you know, we're familiar with that, but that's not new. 
We're just continuing what's been going on since 1923. Number four, koinonia, close relationships. Nobody's going to get lost in a crowd here at Living Word because we really value having close, as it was mentioned earlier by Elena, transparent relationships to build each other up, pray for each other, be involved in each other's lives, minister with each other. Uh, that's a hallmark of this congregation. And then lastly, plurality of supportive elders. Um, today, uh, I am just awed by the humility and um, the unity of spirit among the five elders here at Living Word. There's not going to be any one-man worship or anything. Uh, no one person is totally singled out. Uh, I suggest that to Dave once. Dave, I'd love to hear you teach more often than once a month. Dave said, nothing doing. I want it. We need to hear through all five elders. And that humility, that unity of spirit that we have, uh, God has been using that in, in recent years. So those are the hallmarks. That's 100 years. And it, as the Lord assured us this morning, going to go on for a long time because God is faithful. Thanks, Dan. Great job. Their names have already been mentioned, but I'd just like to especially thank again and ask them to stand uh, three of the mothers of our church, uh, Ann Sharp, uh, Marion Hone, and Marilyn Dreer. Would you ladies stand? We just want to thank you. T together with their husbands, respectively, of course, Wendell and John and Bob, these ladies have, have been leaders and, and servants and pastors and, and ministers in the congregation. And we all, our, our families, our children, all of us have been tremendously blessed by you ladies. So thank you so much. Um, we have a, uh, a number of missionaries that we support, as you uh, know, but uh, we don't, and we don't have time to hear from or, or acknowledge or even mention them all by name. But we do want to... Uh, we do have a, a letter that has been written to us from El Rancho del Rey, and uh, Seema is going to come in just a minute and, and share that with us. Seema is the chairman of the board, and uh, they have a great board at El Rancho, and many of you have been down there. But we can't, again, we can't mention them all, but we do want to at least hear uh, from what uh, the Lord has put on Danny's heart to write to us. And then after that, we have a, a video from our brother Bill Pepper. Uh, he's already also been mentioned, but as you know, he, powerful ministry throughout the years. Uh, in, in Alaska and in Peru and really worldwide. And the ripple effects are still being blessed, uh, are spreading throughout the world. But Simu, would you come? So there are three board members of El Rancho del Rey at Living Word. Uh, Dave, for over 20 years. Liz Massas, for over 15 to 20 years as well. I have been on the board for five years, I think. Uh, I do serve as the chair of the U.S. board, and then there is a, a Mexican board, too. Here's the letter from Danny Moeller, who is our chief executive officer at El Rancho del Rey. Where has time gone? Congratulations, Pastor Dave, Sima, Living Word Board, elders, deacons, members, family, all. A walk down memory lane is in order, recalling the path, the struggles, the victories of yesterday. El Rancho del Rey, it's over 2,000 children, who have been blessed by Living Word uh, Ministry and its staff and team and the Moeller family have been blessed, honored, uplifted, and inspired by the legacy of the men and women who began and continue the ministry known, first known as the Temple, which later gave way to what we now know as Living Word Community. We feel privileged to have walked this walk with you and have been part of this family for what I believe to be the par better part of the second half of these hundred years. The friends whom we've come to know through Living Word have stayed on, being there for us, praying, supporting, encouraging, hosting us, some even as valued counselors and members of the El Rancho del Rey board. Now, some of their children and their grandchildren write, support, and consider us part of their family. What a tribute to the ministry of Living Word and the seeds planted. What a testimony of what God has done in your midst. 
we look back through the archives of our mind and ho oh, how blessed we feel to be under the wings of living word throughout all this time. Let us rejoice in what God has wrought through earthen vessels. Let us look back and say, grandes cosas a hecho Jehová, estaremos a la grace. I'm so sorry for butchering that. To, uh, you can read that in Psalm 126.3 in English. Let us humbly bow down before the king and declare his faithfulness, for surely we can say that his goodness and his mercy have followed us throughout these hundred years, a century of praying and fasting, a century of hope, a century of endurance, a century of faithfulness, a century of battles won and lost and then won, a century of hearing God's voice in the thunder and then waiting and listening for that still small vo voice a century of redemption, a century of ministry and outreach, a century of drought and barrenness, rain and fruit, a century of unfailing, unimaginable, incomprehensible, steadfast love, a century where all that could be moved and shaken has been, and yet here we are celebrating the goodness of God, a century building upon the foundation, a century trusting the Good Shepherd, he has and will guide us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. His temple still stands. And now, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the hands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. Psalm 107, 2 and 3. We rejoice and celebrate with you, amigos. Always yours, Dan Moeller and all of El Rancho del Rey family, Board of Directors and Associates. Greetings on your 100th anniversary to Living Word Community Philadelphia. Give you a little history and then some thoughts. John Grube, my great grandfather, attended the very beginning of this church in Lansdowne, Pennsylvania. Uh, he died at in 62 at age 89. I began attending the church there in 1960 when I was in Bible school and what a joy to get to know the people. And then when God called me to Peru, the elders, Brother Steele was one of them, prayed over me and there was a special time and anointing in that. I often thought those elders must have wondered, what is this young guy going to do? but they prayed over me in faith. And so in 63, the work began in the Amazon jungles of Peru. I met my beloved wife there, and uh, she was from Detroit. What a joy for us to work together 13 years and see 37 churches and outstations founded on the Tapichi River, the Nanai, the Napo, and even in the city of Iquitos. During that time, we were able also to construct four buildings for the original Bible Academy, where we trained pastors, apostles, youth leaders, etc. And that work today is really spreading and growing amazingly. A few years ago, we turned the American side of the work over to my son, David, where he takes teams, raises funds, and does projects in Peru. The work now amazingly has spread into a total of seven nations over 300 churches. The Bible school has been expanded, and then we also have now a TV program, as well as the one we started, Horizons of Hope radio broadcast. It was wonderful to see that impact on the rivers. Sometimes when our evangelists would go to preach, they wouldn't be welcomed at first, and then they'd say, do you listen to Horizons of Hope? Oh yes, Alejandro is our pastor. And that was an open door, something we never understood or thought would happen. We just thought we were ministering on the radio and souls were getting saved. But it had a far greater impact for our evangelists when they came into a community where people were only hearing the Word of God through that program. And then we had to build that Bible school, as I said, and Living Word Community, way back in the day, in 1968, in a special conference, contributed $10,000 to the construction. In today's dollars, that would be like about 90,000 
And so your investment was so important and such a great blessing. And that school continues to function today. Later, we trained then nine couples to take the work over. They've done excellently. And then what have we done since then? Well, we've come to Alaska, led a church for some years that grew from 40-some to 180, giving 123,000 in 1988 to missions, taking many of those people to mission fields. And what are we doing today? Well, we are still ticking. I'm 82. Pretty soon in January, I'll be off to India once again. And by the way, when Seema went a few years ago, she was a great blessing. So many folks from Philadelphia have gone on teams and helped the work, not only in preaching, but in loving, praying, and construction projects. So we want to thank you for your part in what you've done over these many, 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 many years. Now, your investments into the lives and ministry not only are in Peru, now we travel to other nations. And recently, the Lord has laid on my heart a heavy burden for Asia, and in particular, Pakistan and India. Pakistan is open to me in a way faster and larger than any nation I've preached in, and I've been in over 50 of them. And so we're putting great emphasis there. There's a team leaving in just a few days. I won't be able to be on that. I will be Zooming to those conferences in all three cities. But I am looking forward not only to India in January, but to Pakistan in April. Be praying with us for that. And then I want to read for you a scripture that I leave to encourage you, Colossians 1.10. Please, in him, in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. And so you have done excellently living word in the preaching of the word, in worship, in missions, and now, of course, in reaching many that are poor and displaced. We encourage you to win souls and grow the church Continue to be a vibrant blessing in the city of Philadelphia, where I was born. God bless you, is our prayer. We also have close connections with other congregations uh, in the greater Philadelphia area. One of those is Abundant Life Fellowship in New Jersey, and another is Cornerstone. Uh, which you've already heard about, and we want to hear a little bit more about that. And uh, we've asked if Brother Phil Underwood would come, share a word with us uh, about uh, what the Lord lays on his heart and about our warm relationship with him. Phil? So it was with great fear and trepidation this morning that my wife and I uh, set out from the room to come up one of the spokes back to the hub because there are so many different things happening here in Philadelphia today well we got here in quick time so God was with us and why should I be surprised because God has been with you has been with us for a long time now you mentioned uh, the folk that that traveled over from Great Britain and, and I have a a copy of a record of their travels. Um, they, they had a, a copyist or a, a, a secretary, if you like, that they brought with them. And uh, he wrote down everything they did uh, in the visits to the United States of America. So I'm going to leave this with, um, this is a, a recent iteration of it uh, by a friend of mine. Um, it was originally written in Welsh, of course, <laughs> and uh, so it had to be translated by a gentleman called Peter Yeoman, and, and he did so. And so th I'm going to leave this with you. If any of you want copies of this, just uh, talk to Dan. Um, he'll be able to help you with that. Now, um, I said, why should we be surprised? Well, in one of the accounts of their, one of their trips through, uh, from Philadelphia, somebody gave them a car, and believe it or not, they traveled all the way to Altoona. Can you believe that? Why Altoona? 
My wife and I went to Altoona, and that was the question on our hearts as we left Altoona. Why? Well, that's where they were led to by the Lord. And, and again, why should we be surprised? We're not surprised by this, because in here you'll see an account of how they were led by the Lord. And I believe it's, how, it's in our DNA, if you like, to continue, continue to operate in a similar kind of way. So what they did uh, was they would be traveling along. And remember, uh, there were no highways back then. There were just roads, right? And so they would come across a, a nice-looking area, maybe with a bit of a view. I don't know. But it was a place where they had decided to stop. And there they would seek the Lord. The brothers Williams would seek the Lord for that day's message. And they would minister out of that information that night. And it's said of them, from independent sources I might add, that wherever they went, they left the church behind them. And I think that's because they were led by the Lord, as is this place. You've just seen ample evidence of that. During the, a couple of weeks ago, Dave and I were with a, a, a gathering of, of pastors, just a small gathering, and Dave was introducing himself, and he was being so humble. It almost sickened me. <laughs> Do you remember, Dave? And, and I jumped in. <laughs> I am ex exaggerating a little bit. <laughs> no, I know. But, uh, but he was being so humble. And, and I thought, man, i got to jump in and do some justice to this place here. You know? and, and I said, Dave, what about all the people that have gone from this place around the world? Uh, because those people we were talking to uh, were absolutely, totally unaware, apart from one, apart from one whose church we were in. And so um, that's, that's part of the warp and woof of the structure of what God has planted here. And I want to leave you with uh, just two verses. Um, I'd like you to, during the week, please read Ephesians chapter 6, uh, particularly from 10 onwards, and it talks about stand. Stand. I was so pleased at the, uh, the, the tongue and, and interpretations that came, which, you know, it was kind, I, I could prove it to you, but I have it written down on my phone. Um, and so uh, I would like to reiterate that to you. Stand. Stand. And then, and then have the, be, be, be covered in the full armor of God. And then stand. Stand ready. Don't just stand, but stand ready. That's my word to you. Don't just stand. Stand ready. Okay? You know, sometimes we, we read this and we, what, 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 where should we face while we're standing? Where should we face? Uh, no, 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 no. Look, this morning you were exhorted. God's put his hand on you. Touch the man's forehead. Right? Touched our foreheads. We carry a name. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. So stand with the confidence that God is with you. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says he has prepared works in advance for you to do. Look. Look at these wonderful windows. Well, look through them. And understand that the God that has led you to this place is going to lead you on. The God who has placed stars out there and given them their four. I, I heard the other day that something like uh, a million earths, I don't know, I didn't bother to check the figure. It was just too much. But a million earths can fit into our sun. And in him we live and move and have our being. Amen. And so, so God has called you to stand. He has made you ready. And he's structured works in advance for you to do. Such is the calling of God on this place and on the people that are in it. Father, I thank you, Lord, for Cornerstone. I thank you that, Lord, it was planted from this place. People gave of themselves to plant, Lord God, they planted. I thank you, Lord, for the ministry that's taking place through that planting right now and other such plantings like it. So many more than six now. 
And oh, Father, I pray that you bless this home. Bless it, Lord, so that they are brave in you to stand ready for what you're calling to. Lord, you've created them for the works you've created them for. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Well, we've been blessed over the years with close con contact with many congregations and uh, Cornerstone, and as I mentioned earlier, Abundant Life uh, in New Jersey, and uh, the uh, relationship with uh, Pastor uh, uh, Apostle uh, Abraham and Eve Fenton goes back decades, and it's been a close and a dear one, and our relationship with Abundant Life continues. And uh, Aubrey Fenton is here, pastor of Abundant Life. And Aubrey, would you come and share some things with us as the Lord puts on your heart? Good afternoon, Living Word. I, amen. I, I, you look wonderful. You know, you look absolutely wonderful. I want to thank you just for inviting us to be part of such an amazing legacy. This is 100 years my lord 100 that you stood the test of time amen god is good i i bring you greetings on behalf of my father i spoke to him last night and he said i want to go he said i want to go and i said no problem dad i'll take you he said wait he said it depends on how i feel and then, and then after a while he gave up he said just go just go just go ahead and he wants to be here what he doesn't want to do is to have to cancel on me at the last minute and to create a logistical challenge. So what he does often is tap out because he doesn't want to be an inconvenience. But you need to know his heart profusively loves you and that he wants to be here and is celebrating this day with you as long as our entire church board. I shared with them last week, I said, this Sunday I'll be with both of our sister churches that are celebrating their anniversary here in the city. And they got mad at me. They said, if you told us, we would come with you. <laughs> Uh, and so on behalf of the whole church, congratulations. You know, it's this love that we share. And Pastor Dave and I, we're brothers, you know, and, uh, and, and Seema and Carl, and it goes back many generations. And what's precious about Living Word community, it's the love that we share. It's the heart for worship that's always been here and the heart that's open to anyone and everyone else. I heard our brother just ministering and speaking about the works that are prepared beforehand. If I could tell you something in two minutes, it would be walk in those works. There's a time when Joshua was presented in front of the people getting ready to cross the Jordan and his instruction was be strong, be of good courage. And then the Lord parted the Jordan. And if I could share one thing with you tonight or today, it's you've made it a hundred years because this church has been strong. And it's had the faith to do things for God, probably when many others would say not to. Keep the faith. Stay strong. Never be concerned about sharing what God has given you to share. And modeling what God has called you to model. Living Word is so unique. It's a fresh oil. It's the only way I can describe it. It's a fresh oil of God's anointing. You don't find it many other places. It's special. So be Living Word because this city needs it. We love you. We praise God for you, and we're by your side. Amen? God bless you all. Well, we do want to praise the Lord for strong teaching gifts that he's raised up in this congregation over the years, starting back with Fred and down through an unbroken chain of succession of, of lead pastors and elders who have had a real gift uh, in sharing God's word. And uh, I don't know if you have the same uh, observation that I do, but it seems to me that there are kind of two kinds of preachers. There are preachers that um, talk about themselves and their achievements. And then there's another kind of preacher that kind of gets out of the way and uh, lets the word of God speak and lets the Holy Spirit minister to uh, God's people through his word. And uh, Dave Freer is a guy like that. Dave, would you come and share what the Lord has put on your heart for us? Thank you, Ted. 
And thank you for everyone who has already shared. Aubrey, you made it. Aubrey was at New Covenant this morning. He was double booked today, but he made it. Phil, thank you so much. Bill, I'm sure, is doing something somewhere and won't hear, but thank you, Bill, for recording that message. Obviously, to my bride for reading the message from El Rancho. But for all of you folks being here, thank you so much. We have been super, super excited for this day for quite a long time. And we were, you know, very anxious and excited and curious to see who was going to be able to make it. And I've already seen quite a few faces and just smiled greatly when I saw you. Um, I do have an apology to make right off the get-go. I do apologize for the parking issue. If some of you had some challenge parking on the way in, we found out it was the marathon weekend a couple of weeks ago. My heart totally sank. Went online, saw the outline of the race course. They started here at 7 a.m. And I said, 7 a.m., by 8.30, they're going to be gone. And they were. By 8.30, I was here, quarter to nine, they were long gone. But for whatever reason, they don't want us parking on the parkway till 5 p.m. So if you had a little bit of a headache parking today, I apologize. But as I was thinking about that, I said, well, would it really be a living word event if parking were not a headache? You know, if we were still in East Lansdowne, we'd probably have a massive parking lot like Abundant Life or like Cornerstone, and we'd have no problem. But every Sunday, we don't know who it's going to be. Maybe the Polish, maybe the Puerto Ricans, maybe the Greeks. Everybody has a parade. And the thing is, you know, nobody wants to have a parade or a race on Saturday. Saturday is a perfectly good day. Everyone wants to do it on Sunday. But as you heard, this is where the Lord has deposited us. You know, over the years, we've had various financial offers for this property, for this building. Uh, and we've always just said, if it involves us leaving this place, we are not interested. We're not. This is where the Lord has put us. In the middle of of this city. And it's not an accident. It's his doing. It's his doing. And so, yeah, we have a lot of headaches getting here oftentimes. We've got a lot of things to navigate. But if we are convinced that this is where the Lord wants us, then we will continue to press on. And the truth of it is, do we come to worship the Lord because it's easy? Do we come to worship the Lord because it's convenient? No. We come to worship the Lord because he's worthy. That's why. And so next Sunday, I don't know what it's going to be. Probably a Thanksgiving Day parade. I don't know what it'll be. But next Sunday... When you're having trouble getting here, when you're have, having trouble parking, say, you know what, Lord, I'm not coming to worship you because it's convenient. I'm coming to worship you because you're worthy. One other just item of introduction, and I, I realize my time is shorter this morning because we wanted to give our guests an opportunity to share as well. So I was so excited about this. But there has been a group, I, I'd say we as elders probably last February realized, okay, we're 100 years old. And we want to do something special to commemorate the faithfulness of the Lord for a hundred years. And the five of us looked at each other and said, we are not the team to plan anything. If it were left up to us, you know, there'd be a fruit salad downstairs and we'd say, thank you for coming. Praise God. So we said, you know what? We've got to hand this over to someone who is way more qualified than we are. And we were trying to figure out, well, who should we give this massive responsibility to? And we said, you know what? Every spring, the women have an amazing retreat. The men kind of, you know, nothing against the men. We kind of patch things together at the last minute and things are a little, you know, ragged around the edges. But the women, they do an amazing job. I've never been on the women's retreat, but I know. So I said, you know what? They have a committee in place. They have a team in place. Let's just ask if they would be willing to take on the responsibility of all of the things surrounding a 100th anniversary. And they said yes. Now, they recruited some help, 
but I want to just acknowledge them right now. So if you were part of the 100th anniversary planning committee, would you please just stand up so that we can recognize you and the hard work that you've done? Thank you, thank you so much. They were here many, many weekends, late into many nights, making the building look much fresher than it had been, putting together all of the things that were part of this. And so I just wanted to acknowledge them. And personally, I want to say thank you. I've only seen a little bit of what you've done because I haven't been here. I mean, these folks have worked way harder than I have for this, but thank you so much for all the efforts that you put in. Please join with me in a word of prayer and we're gonna take a little bit of time looking at his word together. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you so much for this incredibly joyous celebration and reason for celebration that you have given us today. This community of believers has been here for a hundred years, and that is only a testimony to you, to your goodness, to your faithfulness, to your power, for your desire, Lord, to have this community to exist for these hundred years. And Lord, we just want to acknowledge that you have been so good to us. And Father, we will continue to be here as long as you or ordain it. It is your church. Jesus Christ, you said, on this rock, I will build my church. Living Word community is not ours. It is yours. It is your church, Lord Jesus. You and you alone died to purchase your church for yourself. You and you alone shed your blood to make your church spotless in your Father's sight. And so, Jesus, this is your church. And we will be here as long as you want us to be here. And we pray, Lord God, that you would help us to be faithful. Help us, Lord God, to walk in what you have put in front of us. Today, Lord God, we celebrate a hundred years of what you have done, but we also look to the future for the things that you want to continue to do in our midst and through us. And finally, Father God, I just want to pray that as we take a few minutes now to read your word together, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, you always have something to say, and it's always worth hearing. It's always worth hearing what you have to say. So we pray now, Lord, that you would help our ears to be attentive to your word and to the voice of your spirit as he speaks your word to us. And we pray this, Jesus, in your name and for your glory alone. Amen. Amen. Well, it is not coincidental. We are going to be looking at Joshua chapter 4. And this is actually the very passage that Pastor Aubrey was referring to. And as Ted often says, Aubrey and I, we did not connect beforehand. This is obviously something that the Lord wants to put in front of us. We are going to be looking at a couple of verses from Joshua chapter 4. I'm going to read the opening seven verses of the chapter, then jump down to verse 19 and finish it out. But as Aubrey was already saying, this was an incredibly pivotal moment in the history of Israel. They had finished their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, and they were now ready to finally enter the promised land. It had taken them 40 years because of their sin, because of their failure, because of their hardness of heart, because of their lack of faith. 40 years ago, the promised land had been right there, but they had been unwilling to trust the Lord incapable to really believe that God was able to follow through on his promise. And so for 40 years, they had wandered around the wilderness. But now that 40 years was done. Moses was no longer in charge. Joshua was this new, relatively inexperienced leader. And he was the one that was going to take them across the Jordan and into the promised land. And so in Joshua chapter 4, we're going to read part of that account. Again, picking it up in verse 1 through verse 7, and then jumping down to verse 19. It says, When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests stood, and to carry them over with you and put them down at the place 
where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites and from each tribe and said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you in the future. When your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Jumping now to verse 19. And on the 10th day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal at the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. You know, a hundred years causes us to kind of look over our shoulder and causes us to kind of think about a past. Part of it we were present in, part of us, part of it none of us were there. You know, I've thought, I wonder what Living Word was like in the 1930s. I wonder what we would think of them. I wonder what they would think of us. Hard to imagine. Dan gave us a snapshot into Living Word in the 1940s, in the 50s and 60s as well. But obviously, it has been incredibly different. But what a powerful thing to remember. What a powerful thing to look at the past, to look at our history and consider what the Lord has done. And you know, as I was thinking about that, I thought, simply following Jesus calls us to remember regularly. Constantly, He is drawing our attention to the past. And he is reminding us of what he did 2,000 years ago for us. You know, and we never get tired of looking to that moment in history. We never grow weary. We never can talk about it too much. We can never think about it too much. We can never remember it too often. That moment 2,000 years ago, when the Son of God willingly, went to a cross for each one of us. We will remember that for all eternity. There is power. There's power in remembering the good things that God has done. There is power in looking back and seeing those times and those places where God did incredible things. And as followers of Jesus, this should be a regular part of our devotion to him. And we see here, the Lord made it clear to Joshua, as this nation miraculously crosses a river, and we didn't read it, but at this time of the year, in the early spring, the Jordan was at flood levels. It was at the highest points of its banks as it was the entire year. Why? Because all of the snowfall in the mountains had melted. And the Jordan was not a little trickle. It was not like the Susquehanna in July and August where you could almost wade across it. It was at flood level when God stopped the flow. When God stopped the flow. And miraculously, the waters parted, just as they had 40 years older, earlier on the banks of the Red Sea. And Israel crossed on dry ground. 
But there were priests who were carrying something that to us still seems very strange. The Ark of the Covenant, really, it was just a fancy box, a very, very fancy box. But it was a box that was an earthly replica of the throne of God. And it represented the presence of God. It represented the willingness of God to be in the midst of his people. And as the Jordan River parted, the priests who were carrying that incredible replica of God's throne, they went in first. And they stood where the water should be raging. They stood where the water should have been flowing over them, but it was dry. And they were holding this gold-covered, ornate, beautifully crafted box, the Ark of the Covenant. And as long as they were there, as long as God decreed it, the waters were no longer flowing. And the entire nation crossed into the Promised Land. But as the waters had receded, there were stones that appeared that normally would be unseen to the human eye. Certainly in the ancient world, their ability to explore the bottom of rivers and bodies of water would have been far more limited. And so the Lord told Joshua, appoint 12 men, one from each of the 12 tribes, and have them pick up one of these stones that should be at the bottom of a raging river, but instead it's dry ground because of what I am doing for you. And so Joshua appointed these 12, and in the very place where the priest stood with the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, they picked up a stone. And these were not small little stones, not stones that you could throw through a window or something like that, because it says they put them on their shoulders. So these were stones of, of some size. And, and Joshua said, the Lord is commanding us to carry them to the place where we will camp tonight. And it's Gilgal, the first encampment of the nation of Israel in the promised land. And you are to place these 12 stones on top of each other. And in verse 7, it says, this will be a memorial. This will be an altar of remembrance. Many of the altars that were constructed in the Old Testament, constructed of stone, were meant for sacrifice. But these altars, like the one that we're seeing in Joshua chapter 4, altars of remembrance, they were not a place for sacrifice. They were a place to remember the good things that the Lord has done. And they would have been stacked in such a way that you would have known someone intentionally put them there. You wouldn't walk by and not notice it. Some of you are hikers. On the East Coast, most of the trails that we hike on are marked by blazes on trees, rectangles of different colors that let you know you're heading in the right direction. But out West, there's not a lot of trees in a lot of the places where you hike, particularly in the Southwest. So they have a different way of marking trails. Some of you are quite familiar with this because there's a university that bears this name. They make piles of stones that, that couldn't have been placed there just by wind or water or hikers kicking them along. They place pile of stones to mark the trails and they're called cairns. And as a hiker, you see these piles of stones and you know that's where you're supposed to go because it's something that catches your eye. Well, this altar of remembrance, you would have noticed it. You would have seen it. If you were walking in the area of Gilgal, if you were walking along the banks of the Jordan, you would have seen it. And you see, the Lord knew that a coming generation would go that way and see that pile of stones. And the younger generation would ask the older generation, what does this mean? Why is this here? And you see, then the older generation had an opportunity to declare the good things that God had done. Daughter. Son, let me tell you what our God did for us. Let me tell you what our God did for us right here. The power of remembering. The power of declaring. When we remember the good things of God, it strengthens our heart, it encourages us, it feeds us, it sustains us. But when we remember the good things of God, we are called upon to share those. To share those. Tell the good things 
of God. Don't leave them to yourself. Don't keep them to yourself. Tell of the ways that God has transformed your life. Tell of the incredible things that he has done for you. Tell of the cross 2,000 years ago where the Son of God died for all of us. Tell of the good things of God. That was why there was an altar of remembrance. That's why Joshua was called upon to make this memorial so that people would stop and say, what is the meaning of this? And then there would be opportunity to share the good things that God has done. There is power in remembering. And there is power in declaring what we remember. You know, you've heard it said today a couple of times. It's been referred to fairly politely, and that's absolutely fine. You know, not all of Living Word's history is glorious. There were some really, really dark chapters. You know, I mentioned this in the pastor's meeting that Phil was referring to. And Phil, as he said, immediately corrected it because everything that Phil said is absolutely right. God has done incredibly glorious, powerful, wonderful things through the believers who have been here over this past century. But you know, one of the things that amazes me about this is this is incredibly honest. David was a man after God's own heart. He was also an adulterer and a murderer. Abraham was a man of incredible faith. He was also a liar. Moses was the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, but he also dishonored God in front of the nation. You know, one of the things that God is never afraid to do is peel the curtain back. You know, sometimes we want to forget the nasty stuff. Sometimes we want to gloss over or maybe even pretend that stuff didn't happen. But you know, the Bible never really does that. The Bible never really does that. Why? Well, I think for most of us, that's very obvious. We never glory in the sin. We never glory in the utter mess that poor human decisions make of the incredible things that God has done. We never glory in that. But then why don't we try to hide it? Why don't we try to ignore it? You know, the Apostle Paul was always very candid about saying, before I came to Christ, I was killing Christians. I was persecuting the church. Why didn't he try to hush that up? Why didn't he try to say, no, that didn't happen? Because the thing is, we are not here because of anything that anyone except God alone has done. And the failures of Living Word community, the failures of Gospel Temple, the darkest chapters in our history, all that does is remind us that we are here only because of the grace of Jesus Christ. We are not here because we're better than another church. We're not here because we've got more things figured out. We're not here because we had better leaders, more gifted leaders. I love the other four elders. I love this group that God has called me to. But you guys know us. We're not the slickest. We're not the swiftest. We're not the most polished. You know, we're not the wisest. We're not the most anointed. We're none of that. You know that. But praise God, we're not. Because I don't want the glory. And Ted and Ephraim and Carl and Dan, they don't want the glory. And you know what? Jesus doesn't want to give us the glory because we don't deserve it. He does. He does. I don't want to go into the nitty gritty of the awful things that have happened as part of our history, but I don't want to ignore those either because what that convinces me of is we are here not by human effort, not by human wisdom, not because we're better than anyone else. We are here because of the grace of Jesus Christ. That's why we've made it a hundred years. And if we make it a hundred years more, that's why we will make it a hundred years more. Because Jesus Christ is the only one who builds his church. Jesus Christ didn't say, and on this rock, I will build your church. He said, on this rock, I will build my church. One of the things that we pray regularly at the elders meeting is Jesus living word is yours. You have called us to shepherd this community with you, but you are the great shepherd of the sheep. I'm not mentioned in John chapter 10. Jesus is. 
Jesus is the shepherd of Living Word Community. He always has been. He always will be. For reasons that are beyond me, he chooses to call individuals to partner with him. And one of the things I love about Living Word is most of you in one way or another are actively partnering with him in some form of service, in some form of ministry, in some sort of effort to keep his presence in this body of Christ. And I love that. But he is the shepherd. He is the shepherd. You know, I want to close by saying this. You know how hard it is for me to preach short. I was given 10 minutes. I apologize. I'm way over 10 minutes, but I'm much less than the hour I normally am. And you know how I know that? Because none of you are sleeping. I know I've hit the point where I've gone too long when I start to see the head bob. None of you are bobbing today, so thank you for that. But the last thing that I want to say, and it's been mentioned a couple times already, you know, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are constantly called to remember. We are constantly called to look behind and, 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 and focus on the good things that God has done. But you know what? At the same time, we're constantly called to look to the future. As we remember the death of Jesus Christ on that cross and his glorious resurrection, we look to the day when he will come again. When the heavens will part and you know what? This is all going to be over. Praise God. So as a community, as a very, very small representation of his church in this world, what I hope has been happening and will continue to happen, that we will use this time reflecting on the goodness and the faithfulness of God over a hundred years to inspire us to keep moving forward. May the goodness of God in the past, may the faithfulness of God in the past encourage us to keep pressing on. May it give us a greater vision for what he wants us to do. May it give us a greater zeal to step into what he wants us to do. May we not just rest on a hundred years and say, okay, we made it. May we say a hundred years is a great start. Jesus, what do you have for us next? What is on your horizon for us? As we look to the past and celebrate and rejoice, may we look to the future and say, Jesus, wherever you're taking us, may I be willing, excitedly following. May that be our declaration today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you so much for a wonderful day to celebrate you, to celebrate your faithfulness, to celebrate your goodness. Lord, thank you for what you did some 1,500 years before your son even came into the world, parting the Jordan River. And you said, put some stones there so that my people will remember. Thank you for what you did 2,000 years ago, Jesus, when you came into this world and became just like us to die on a cross and rise in victory for us. We remember that as well, and we thank you for that. We thank you for our 100-year history because it does indicate your hand upon us, the things that you have done through us, the tough times that you have brought us through, but it is all and only a testimony to your grace and your goodness. And Lord, I pray that as your people, we would be quick to tell and to speak and to give voice to the good things that you have done. And as we consider where we've been, may you through your spirit, through your word, through conversation, may you stir in us a greater excitement to move forward in the things that you have for us. And Jesus, it is in your name and for your glory alone that we pray these things. Amen. Thank you.